everything is doing. And I just like stuff like that about Jesus. Now, just for the sake of anyone who wasn't here last week, we know, um, I, I just want to say this again, just for the sake of anybody. I've been to Israel four times. And I, I've been to the Garden Tomb, and I put this on Facebook and Instagram. Did anybody catch that? Yeah. Okay, so uh, basically I'm going to say the same thing here. But um, you go to a Garden Tomb. It's the very last thing you're going to see on a tour when you go to Israel. That's the last thing. And you get to have communion, in there's a garden. It's pretty cool. But that's not the tomb. You know, no one ever truly believed it was, but it's really cool, okay? And it has a lot of proper description to it as you look in it and what the Bible describes, it's like, yeah, it just feels right, but it isn't. Scholars, more scholars have done more work and dating different things as far as the way it's built and stuff like that. And they say now from other historians too, from the time periods, that the place where Jesus was crucified and the place of his resurrection is more on the area of what's called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which in Israel, you'll visit that also which I don't like. Because everywhere where something big happens, they build a church over it. And it, as years go by, it's gaudy and more gaudy and gaudy and John Gaudy and gaudy, okay? <laughs> it's just like you walk in like, really, you gotta you got do all this stuff? I wish it was in the garden where you visit the tomb, but it's not. They say it's more, scholars say it's more in that area right there. Much to my sadness, I have to admit that because I really liked it the other way. Now, real quick, look at verse 42. It says, therefore, because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. What, what are they preparing for again? Passover. Passover. So they got to get Jesus off the cross quick because if they touch, if it hits next day like at dusk and Passover begins and they've touched a dead body, guess what? They're unclean. And guess what they can't celebrate? Passover. So they got to move really fast. But here's what's cool about that. They don't understand yet what you and I both know is that Jesus is our Passover, right? That they don't need to celebrate the old Passover anymore. He's our Passover, New Testament says. And so we're not, our sins aren't passed over. Our sins are washed clean by our Passover lamb, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So I like that. Now the resurrection, chapter 20 and verse 1. And I like talking about this stuff. And I can only go so far in it because if you let me, it, you'd be here for weeks and weeks on this one. And you'd just be saying, Jim, just get on with it, okay? <laughs> now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark. Say still dark. Still dark. And saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. Now, if you're Mary, you come up to it and see the stone rolled away, what would you think? What's your first thought? Grave robbers. Grave robbers. Tomb robbery, yeah, grave robbers. Somebody took the tomb. Now, she gets there. It's the first day of the week. Uh, what day is that? What's the first day of the week? Sunday. It's Sunday. Uh, why do you and I come together and go to church, worship on Sundays? Because that's the day that Jesus rose from the dead. That's why you and I do it. You find that in the book of Acts. You find it in 1 Corinthians 16 too. That's what you find. The early church, they came together, worshiped on Sundays. That's why we do it too. Because that's the day he rose from the dead. Now, Mary Magdalene, she comes to the tomb, and it's still what? Dark. It's still dark. Hmm. So when it's still dark, it's the cool of the day, is it not? And it's in a garden, is it not? Now let's think of the parallel. In the Garden of Eden, God comes looking for Adam in the what? In the cool of the day, which is a normal time when God would dialogue with Adam, right? So now you're watching parallels to what was originally and now what is right now. Isn't that a pretty cool thing right there? So you th see these things parallel on each other. Now, Mary, and we know from other Gospels, Mary doesn't come by herself. There's other women with her, and they're bringing more what? They're bringing more spices. That's right. So they're just, which means what? Do they expect them to be alive? They expect them to be dead. They're just bringing more spices. The women who are the first ones of the tomb, and the disciples who are hiding somewhere in some room because they're afraid of, for their lives, nobody expected Jesus to rise from the dead, which we say it like this, nobody expected no body in the tomb, okay? Nobody expected that. And so here come the women, and they're bringing more of this stuff. Here's a cool thing. From the Gospel of Mark, 
We know in the Greek words used for the stone rolled in his gospel, we know from history that those tombstones are like one and a half to two tons. The Greek in the gospel of Mark says the stone was rolled uphill. It wasn't rolled like this way down, uphill. How do you roll that thing uphill? Back uphill. That, that's the Greek that Mark uses in his. So when you put that all together, um, you think about when the people say, well, the disciples came and they stole the body. How in the world do they move a stone one and a half to two tons uphill and not wake up the Roman guards right there? If indeed the guards fell asleep. And if they had fallen asleep, they lose their life over it. So that's an impossibility right there. Now, <clears throat> think about the women. They're coming there early in the morning and they're bringing more spices. There's a handful of them. The stone weighs at one and a half to two tons. But they're going to put more spices on Jesus' body. How are they going to roll that stone? As they're walking there, how are they going to roll that stone? Do you think they know how? No, it didn't matter to them, did it? Because they love Jesus. And when you love someone or you love, love just moves you. You don't know how you're going to do it, but you're just going to get it done, huh? Because you love that person and you think about that. That's what they're, they don't know how they're going to roll that stone, but they're going to get in there because they love Jesus. Now, he's risen from the dead. And like I've said probably before, I've had a few people tell me in my life in this kind of sarcastic tone, I can't believe that anybody could ever rise from the dead. And I love when they tell me stuff like that. Because now I can ask them, well, why? What's your evidence? What's your evidence, you know? Well, give, me, give me your why. Well, let me tell you a couple things. And there's so many ways we could cover this. And you've heard me cover it many different ways on Sunday. I will reiterate those on Sunday many times over because I want you to defend what our faith is built upon, and that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what it's built on, my friends. Okay. Here's a question. How do we know George Washington really lived? Oh, history books. Which means what? Which means what? Well, who wrote these things originally? Does that mean that somebody that lived at the same time as him wrote that down? Somebody who knew about his life wrote it down in a book? Does that they mean that? Say yes. I'm not tricking you, okay? It feels like it, doesn't it? It always feels like it, huh? Now, that's the way historians, a way historians do history. They go with who wrote what about that person in the same time frame, right? Right? Okay, good. Well, we have people who lived at the same time of Jesus, and they wrote things also, did they not? We have these disciples who are eyewitnesses to the event and they wrote these things down. Did they not? The same way historians do history is the same way we do history at the resurrection, except atheists will say, oh, you can't trust the disciples. And they'll always say that. They'll say, oh, they're just religious and they're biased and this and that. No, no, no. We have historical eyewitnesses. That's your best evidence right there. Now, what we have are completely inside, outside Christianity, we have nine contemporary authors of the time period. And we have 27 documents that talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ from eyewitnesses. I'm just talking purely historical right now. Are you following me on this one? This is the way they do history right here. And we need to follow the pattern for history. That's the way you come to... to you, you find out what happened in history. I have a question for you. If the disciples made it all up, his resurrection, what was their motivation? What was their gain? I got a better question with that question. That's this. Why do, well, in our fallen world, what are the motivators for people in situations to make things up or whatever? Money, sex, power. Did the disciples get any of that stuff? No, none of it. They lost power, in fact. There was no motivation for them to make these things up whatsoever. And all the historical evidence points that Jesus rose from the dead. Now, I got four 
point, four points here. Here we go. There's four things. And the first one is this. And these are just very practical, logical. Both the tomb and the birthplace of the church are in Jerusalem. I think this is what I wrote today in Facebook. It is right? That's what I wrote today. Okay. What do you mean by that? This is so logical. Where was Jesus crucified? What city? Jerusalem. Where did, where did he rise from the dead? What city? What city was the church born in? Is Jerusalem a big metropolis at that time? No. So when the church is born there, and it's born on the southern steps of the Temple Mount, the church of the Holy Sepulchral area where the resurrection happened, 300 yards maybe, maybe 400 yards. Now, all these religious leaders that want to stop Christianity, what, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, what's the one thing they could just do to stop it all? Walk 300, 400 yards to where that tomb is, have them roll that stone, have them bring that dead body, plant it right over here on the southern steps, and show everybody Jesus never rose from the dead. They didn't do that, did they? Why didn't they do that? Could we know why? Come on, guys, why? It's empty. There's no, there's no body there. He rose from the dead. Now, people will say, I'm, a, I'm devil's advocate. Well, uh, you know, they wouldn't have recognized him because it's 50 days later after the resurrection. No, science has already stated that in that arid climate, 50 days later, you could still recognize the body of Jesus. You could still recognize who he is. And by the way, if they want to stop it, wouldn't they just go drag out any decomposed body? Yeah. And then, <laughs> I better stop because I'm going to keep going down that road. Okay. Okay. Now, here's another one. Um, secondly, uh, people claim Jesus faked his death. You ever heard that one? Hey, he faked his death. Oh, really? They, remember we talked about the swoon, swooning? Last, was that last week or two weeks ago? Okay, well, let's do it again for somebody who didn't catch that or maybe somebody joined us. Now, let's just think of it logically. Jesus faked his death. So somehow he faked his death and they put him in the tomb and he's in there waiting and three days later, boom, here I am. And he walks out and says, hey, everybody, here I am. Okay, let's logically think about that. Did they scourge him? Was his back open? You could see all the organs in his back? Yes. Did he lose an enormous amount of blood? Yes. Yeah. Was he in shock? Yes. Yeah. Did they pierce his side? Yes. Did they nail him? Yes. Yeah. All those things. He was beaten so badly. And crucified victims usually didn't even survive the crucifixion. Now, beaten so badly, you're telling me, let's let me get this straight. He's up there, and now I'm going to fake my death. I'm faking it. And I'm beaten so badly, they put me in a tomb, and I'm in there, and three days later, they roll that stone, and I just come walking out like nothing, right? Right? No. Even today in our modern hospitals and modern medicine, he would be in ICU for six months to a year to be able to just sit up or even stand up eventually. But they're saying, oh, no, he faked it, walked right out. That's impossible. It's absolutely impossible that he did that. Now, I'll give you another one on the resurrection. These are all just logical things. Number three, James, the brother of Jesus, believed his brother was God and died a martyr. Uh, his own half-brother James, you know, same mom, different dad. His own brother James comes to faith in Jesus. And if you remember in your Gospels, do you remember there was a moment in time where Jesus' family, including James, thought their brother Jesus was insane? Yes. You're insane. He thinks he's the Messiah. He's insane. Now, how does James move from my brother's insane to my brother's God in the flesh, the Messiah? How does he move from that to that? What must happen? Resurrection. Yes, resurrection. Can you imagine? And by the way, 1 Corinthians 15 says that Jesus appeared to James. Can you imagine the first time they saw each other when Jesus appeared to James' brother? Can you imagine what happened? And Jesus sits there and goes somewhere like, bro, it's me. Can you imagine? I can't do it right now. I'm on, I'm on, I'm on film. So you can ask me, but keep it for afterwards. Okay. Um, so yeah, so it would be like, oh my gosh. And by the way, when people say, well, you know, and by the way, James, according to Josephus in 61 or 62 AD, 
the Sanhedrin threw him off the Temple Mount and he dies a martyr for his brother. Why would he die a martyr for his brother if his brother wasn't the Messiah? And when people tell you this, because remember, I'm, watch the terms. They say, a lot of people die for what they believe and they do that. Okay, wait, wait. Do you hear what they, they, hear what they just said? A lot of people die for what they believe. No, James and the disciples died for what they saw. That's different. That's different, okay? Not what they believe. It's what they saw. And by the way, if you've got 11 disciples and they're dying as martyrs, don't you think one of them would eventually say, it was a joke? One of them, would, I'm, I don't want to die, okay? Because, you know, one of them would, would, would deny it. None of them did. They all went, they, they're dying martyrs' death for these things. Now, I wrote down a statement for you that I found a couple years back because I like this statement. It's in your notes. It's, you don't have to fill it in. Here it is. It says, People believe that we all evolve from a single organism, but find it impossible to believe that a man rose from the dead from a single tomb. So you, you're telling me you believe that we evolved dead matter, formed a single organism, then evolved to DNA information that produced more information, higher information, higher information. You believe all that all happened, but you can't believe a man, a God man, came out of a single tomb. Think of the, re do you hear what I just said? It's like, I, I, I believe that, but I, but I just can't believe the other one. Now, you heard me say on Sunday, I talked about evolution, right? Remember that? Anybody remember that? Good, four of you. But anyway, no, yeah, you all nodded. Now, remember what I said about all the, what's called intermediate stage species or in-between species? Look, if we've been evolving over millions of years, which lie, number one, millions of years, no, we've been here about 6,000 years, humans. But they say millions of years we're evolving, and all these animals are evolving, lizard to bird. I think it was, like I said, cow to whale, I think it is what they say. And humans are evolving. If this is true over millions of years, wouldn't there be millions and millions of in-between stage bones all over the world? Wouldn't you be digging them up in your yard? I mean, you're, I'm going you, to plant this plant. Well, honey, oh, no, there's, it's a half lizard, half bird here. <laughs> you, they'd be everywhere. And how many bones do we find? None. Nothing. All those things like Neanderthal man, Piltdown man, Peking man, Java man, Lucy, all of it. No, no. All made up, proven to be false. All of it. And when they bring Lucy, have you ever seen Lucy? It's a chimpanzee. But they, oh, it's my ancestor. No, it's your ancestor, not my ancestor. <laughs> and, and then the, the knee to prove that she, Lucy could walk upright. You know, they found that knee, I think, I'm going to get my distance wrong, but it was like, it was like 100 yards away and about four, 40 to 50 feet down in the dirt. Not even with the body. But they go, oh, it's got to be part of this. Really? Wow, how convenient. No, 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 no. Do you know? God, i got to move fast, okay? Because I like this topic. What they do have, archaeologically, is they have, the only evidence that they have is nothing that evolved, but all of a sudden, in life burst on the scene. It's called the Cambrian Explosion. Well, what a coincidence, huh? That God just creates it all, comes on the scene. Do you know how these evolutionists, how they date things and stuff like that? Do you guys know that? They have a chart. And they have different levels of sedimentary le levels. And if they find this certain thing, uh, let's say they find a trilobite, they just look on their chart and say, oh, it's down here. That's when it was on the sedimentary charger. So it lived 300 million years ago. That's what they do. And they do that for everything. It's like it's ridiculous what these people do. Now, I'm going to move on because... Uh, I'll just keep going and going. Now, verse, um, verse, uh, verse 2. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb. Who's they, by the way? The tomb robbers, right? She don't believe there's resurrection. They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb. And we, remember I said there's other women there with her? Because the other Gospels tell us there's more women there. We do not know where they have laid him. Now, <clears throat> principle of embarrassment. Another one right here. 
Women are the first eyewitnesses. I have told you this so many times now. What is the problem here? In that day, in that culture, a woman's testimony in court was considered untrustworthy. If you're going to kick off a resurrection of Christianity, you would never put that in there. But since they put that in there, and by the way, it's in every one of the Gospels that the women are the first eyewitnesses, and each Gospel was written in a different part of the Mediterranean. Nobody collaborated with it. They didn't do this, and they all put it in there. And, and when it, since it's in there, and you know you would never put it in there if you want to get it off the ground, it had to be true. It had to be true. The women are the first uh, testifiers of the resurrection of Jesus. Now, the story gets more interesting. Watch this, verse 3. So Peter and the other disciples went forth, and they were going to the tomb. So she comes back and says, hey, the tomb's empty. Somebody took our Lord's body. So Peter, who's the other disciple? More than likely, it's John, the writer of the Gospel of John. Yeah. Okay, so she goes, tells them, you know, and how many disciples go running to the tomb? Two. Why don't they all go run in? Because a woman's testimony was considered untrustworthy. Think about it, right? It's logical. The woman comes, hey, the <laughs> right, sure, sure, Mary. But Peter and John, boom, meet me. They're going, right? Verse 4. The two are, watch this. The two are running together. So they're neck and neck. And the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. Question, is John simply just faster than Peter? Or is Peter slowing down? It's an interesting question, huh? Let's just say that Peter's slowing down. Wow. If Peter's slowing down, why would he slow down? Shame. What happened the last time he saw Jesus? He denied him. Mm -hmm. And in one of the Gospels, it says, once he denied him that final time, Jesus looked at him and they met eye to eye. And Peter runs out and weeps bitterly. So he's run into the tomb. And maybe he just starts to think to himself, oh, I don't want to see him face to face. I let him down. I felt shame. But here's the cool thing. We know because of the blood of Jesus and what Jesus has done and as followers of Christ that God forgives our sins and remembers them no more. If you want scripture verse on that, Hebrews 10, 17. You never have to worry or be afraid of coming to Jesus because of that blood of Jesus. Now watch this because John, the words he uses are so cool. Verse five through eight. And stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Who got there first? John. He comes into the tomb, he stoops, he's looking in. He doesn't go in, but he's there looking in. Verse 6, and so Simon Peter also came following him and entered the tomb, and he saw the linen wrappings lying there. Peter comes later after him, and he comes, and he goes into the tomb, and he sees the linen strips right there, laying there. So he sees that. Then verse 7, and the face cloth, which had been on his head, Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So, the other disciple who had first come, who was the first one to the tomb? John. Had first come to the tomb, then also entered, and he saw and believed. So, once Peter goes in and sees, then John decides to go in and see, and he looks in and he believes. Now, the word for see, S-E-E, -E, to see, it'll be S-A-W, they saw. These Greek words are very important with each one, what's happening. Here's what's going on. In verse 5, John gets there, 
And it says, he saw the linen wrappings. Okay. The word saw that John uses means he observed without understanding. He's looking at it, but he doesn't get it. It doesn't make sense. He he observes it, but he doesn't understand it. Now, in verses 6 and 7, Peter arrives. He goes in, and it says, he saw the linen wrappings. And the word saw there that John uses for Peter means he examined for the purpose of investigating. So in other words, Peter is analyzed. He's looking at the linen wrappings and he's trying to, he's, he, he's analyzing. And by the way, guys, scholars all say the same thing, that the way it's structured in the Gospels is that these strips of cloth that were wrapped around Jesus' body, they had a certain resin, resin to them also. So what they see is, they see the form still of Jesus' body, but his body's not in there. Is that wild or what? That's why they're looking at, what in the world? And all the pieces that were wrapped around his head, they're rolled up nice, put in the corner. What grave robber tidies up? (laughs) Right? So their minds are being baffled, like, what is going on? We're looking at all the evidence. And then in verse 8, it says that John goes in and he saw and he believed. Now, this word saw means he perceived with understanding. John goes in, looks at it, and he goes, I get it. I understand. I, he rose from the dead, and he believes. Is that wild or what? Now, let me finish it off with verse 9. For as yet they, all the disciples, did not understand the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. John's the only one who got it. Nobody else got it yet. Okay, so let, let me leave you with this last thought. Just the thought. Because I, I like stuff like this. Jesus, back up. Lazarus, when Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. Remember that story? On the resurrection and the life, he who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. When Lazarus rises out of the tomb, what words does Jesus use after Lazarus is brought back from the dead? What does he say? Unbind him, let him go. In other words, Lazarus is wrapped with strips of cloth, right? He says, unbind him, release him. Because he's still wearing this, the death cloth around him. When Jesus rises from the dead, is he still wearing the cloth? See, Lazarus comes back to the He's still mortal, and he's got to die. He has to. Jesus, so, he, he, so he's still wearing the death clothing. Jesus, when he rises from the dead, is he going to die again? No, he's resurrected, and he's not mortal. He's in an immortal, eternal body now, and he doesn't need any of the strips of cloth. He will never need those things again because he's, he's, well, he's in immortality now. And you and I will walk in that same type of body because John writes in 1 John 3, 2 that when we see him, we will be like him for we will see him just as he is. And we'll walk in that immortal body. But Jesus sheds it forever because he's, he's in an immortal, incorruptible, eternal, resurrected body. And he wears that body throughout eternity for every one of us. How, how do I know that's true? Because Revelation chapter 1 <laughs> When Jesus returned, it says they'll look on him whom they have pierced. They'll see the pierce marks in that resurrected body still. And that's what he showed to Thomas, and that's what we'll see next week as we continue. So let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for for teaching us, for giving us, God, um, your word. Thank you, Lord God, for all of it. And I just pray that we are able to defend our faith It's so logical. Christianity makes so much sense. And the resurrection is provable. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen.